Welcome to a big video. Today I'm going to show you how to make the switch from editing in Premiere Pro to editing in DaVinci Resolve. I made the jump a couple years ago so I can walk you through things from a Premiere user's perspective, show you where some of the different features and tools are, and also go through some of the roadblocks and the kind of the things that confused me when I was just starting out. And before we start, leave a comment down below letting me know why you want to jump into DaVinci Resolve. I'd be really curious to know. Now without any further ado, let's learn how to use it. So when you open up the app, you're going to see your list of projects. I don't have much in here right now because I actually just switched to the cloud, Blackmagic Cloud. I might do a video on that later. Let me know. But you're going to see your whole list of projects here. Uh, you might see it as a thumbnail view first. I personally prefer using list view, but you can do whatever you'd like. But to make a new project, you can click the Create New Project button at the bottom. You'll get a window to name it. I already have a project ready to go, so I'm just gonna use that. But before you create a new project, you should understand that projects work differently in Resolve. Resolve is a database, and all your projects are kept inside of that database. So there aren't any active project files like Premiere has. Instead, if you wanna share a project with somebody else, you're gonna go ahead and right-click that project and then go export that project. It'll pop up this window for you so you can choose where you wanna save it. Then the person you're sharing it with would import that project file into the database on their computer. And then if they make changes to it inside their database, they would need to re-export the project and send it back to you to re-import it again onto your computer. It's a little tedious, but that's just how it works. So I already have a project started for this, so let's get going. So one of the first things you might notice about Resolve is that it's separated into seven distinct tabs at the bottom that pull you through the editing process. This is kind of like workspaces in Premiere, though in Resolve you have to go through each of them in order to finish your project. It walks you through step by step. But that's okay because each workspace has a very different interface and tool sets. Unlike Premiere where every workspace is kind of the same, but just with one or two different panels on the side. Also, the Resolve UI is very modular. And so you can make panels appear or disappear pretty much as needed. And that is true across the entire interface bring these panels back and then we'll start looking at the media page. So starting off in the media tab, in the top left you have the media storage panel, which is like the media browser in Premiere. This is looking at various locations on your computer and you can import footage from there. So in this case I have a drive, I can see everything that's on that hard drive and I could import something from there. Or, of course, you could just open up Finder, I have a project ready to go here, and I can just import all of my media that way. Change project frame rate, sure. Drag them into my footage bin. To make bins, if you're gonna organize things, you just right click, new bin. Let's pretend this was a music bin. You could do that. I can also explore in here. Just like on the project open, you can look at this with list or thumbnail view, or you also have like a metadata view like this. The media preview, if we load one of these clips up, you can see there's the shot that we got. We can toggle through all these things. Like I'm just shooting just that. No. We can set in and out points for that media if we wanted to. And down here, we can also look at the inspector and we can make adjustments to it. This is just for the sake of previewing. We can also go over to the metadata panel and again, see more metadata about each of those clips that you bring into your project. Now to make a timeline from here, you could just select all of your clips and then right click, create new timeline using selected clips. It'll ask you what you want to name it. We'll just call it car, keep it simple. And now we have a sequence with all of those clips added to it. Before I move on, if you have multicam sequences, you can set those up here as well. You would just select all of the media that is in the multicam, you would right click, create new multicam clip using selected clips, and it would give you all the various options you want. If you're gonna sync them with in points or out points or time code, you can name that sequence, and then you would just create that when you're good to go. Also, if we select one of these clips, if we go down to the bottom of this list, you have lots of options in here to replace the clip, unlink it, relink it, we probably use this plenty if you have an offline online process or if you're jumping between hard drives a lot. In general, a lot of these functions can be done also from the media pool that's on the edit page tab. But if you have a lot of organizing you need to do, you have a big interface in here on the media tab to get all that stuff done. 
Now one thing to know about DaVinci is that it handles timeline settings a bit differently than Premiere does. Your resolution and frame rate are actually set at the project level. So if you actually go to the bottom corner and click your settings, you can see master settings, our timeline is set to a 1920 by 1080 HD timeline. This means that every timeline that we create will actually be set to these settings by default and we can change this. So, you know, if we wanted to make this a 4K timeline, sure we could, or we could do something else, do custom settings if you'd like. <clears throat> and then once we had what we wanted, we could just save. However, what if you wanted to make a timeline that was different? Like maybe you needed to make a social media size timeline. Well, we can actually override those settings. So what I would do is I would just, let's pretend we're gonna duplicate this, car copy. We're gonna right click, go to timelines, timeline settings, and then in this bottom corner you see use project settings. You could uncheck that, and let's pretend we want to make a tall for Instagram or something. You could do that, 1080 by 1920, and if we double click it, now you can see, it's not all scaled correctly, but you can see we have a vertical sequence. Now you may have noticed that we skipped this second tab down here. This is the cut page. I'm gonna be honest, I never use this page at all. It's a very streamlined editing experience. Some people really like it. It pairs well with the speed editor. But if you're coming from Premiere, you're probably just gonna to wanna to look at the full edit page. Okay, the edit page. This is probably where you need to spend the bulk of your time. And at first glance, it works pretty similarly to Premiere. You have your timeline in the bottom, of course. The medium pool, which we were just looking at on the media page, all that is up here with all of your footage and clips. If we wanted to drop a clip into our timeline, all these clips are already there, but just pretending, we could just drop it in like so. We can also double click it to load it into the source monitor. I have one view right now, but let's go to the top corner. That actually gives us two views. So this is our timeline, our program monitor, and this is our source monitor. And we can just jump through and look at all these clips. You could drag the whole thing in. You could also set in points and out points. You could also bring in just the video into the timeline or just the audio into the timeline. Lastly, you could also drag your footage over here and you would get all of these different options of like how you could insert or overwrite, ripple, things like that. I never worked this way, but maybe you will. Figured I'd let you know that it's there. By default, with our mouse, we could just trim clips in the timeline. If we also go to where an edit is, we could roll those clips in the timeline. Holding command and pushing plus and minus to zoom in and out on the timeline, FYI. If we go above the timeline, we have another toolbar that has more options for trim tools. Like in this case, we could slide this clip. We could also use this tool to ripple and push our sequence around like that. We also have this toggle for snapping in the timeline. So if I turn this off, it just kind of freely drags. If I turn it back on, It'll snap, bink, into position just like that. This link icon right here would actually link our audio and video together. So if you can see if I click, both the video and audio are selected, but if I don't click that, I'll just click another one. You can see it only selected this video and it left the audio by itself. Also, if your edit is done, you could use position lock and this will actually lock your whole sequence. So I'm clicking, dragging, but they're not gonna move. This will just kind of keep it safe if maybe you're approved and you're gonna work on color and you don't wanna accidentally shift something when you're not supposed to. You also have options for markers here, flagging clips, and some quick toggles over here for zooming in on the timeline. You could also just drag this for your zoom. And the last thing on the timeline before I move on is over here. This gives us some view options for our timeline. So I actually like to use this one here. This gives us stack timelines and it creates tabs. So if I had multiple timelines, I could see them tabbed across here. You can also turn off if you want thumbnails or have less thumbnails, adjust the tracks, size, options for showing your waveform. And you can customize that to however you'd like. So up in the top right, we have the inspector panel. This functions very similarly to the effects controls panel inside of Premiere, but it has even more options. 
So let's separate into tabs for video, audio, effects, transitions. We don't have any of these things at the moment, but if we did, they would be on. And you can see some file metadata and stuff again at the end. On the video tab, you have pretty standard transform controls. So in this case, let me go to the better part of the shot. You could zoom in, position, rotation, the usual suspects. If we scroll down, we have some other fun things like cropping, dynamic zoom, which actually would create a zoom effect for the entire duration of the clip. In the composite tab, we also have our blending modes. Those are pretty common. You also have things like your opacity. Down below, you could go to stabilization, if you, which is kind of like using warp stabilizer in Premiere Pro. You could just go in and click it, stabilize. It would analyze it, stabilize the clip. That looks pretty bad, but you get the point. You also get lens correction and some scaling options. So if this project's timeline settings and this clip didn't actually match, you would probably go into the scaling and you would adjust it so that DaVinci would automatically scale it to fill the frame correctly. Then moving over, we have the audio tab. Again, what you would expect here, you have things like volume. One thing I like about Resolve is that it actually gives you feedback in the corner so you can see that waveform getting larger or smaller panning, pitch, and you also have an EQ adjustment right in here for every single clip. And while you're working with audio, your mixer is down here and you can see those audio levels as your timeline plays. Now for some other odds and ends, if we right click these clips and we go up to the top and create new compound clip, it merges them together into one clip kind of like a nest in Premiere Pro or a pre-comp in After Effects. And if you right click it again, you can go up to open in timeline and you can see now we have these two clips in their own little pre-comp inside of our main timeline. Okay, let's get into some of the fun stuff and talk about effects. Since we were just looking at the inspector panel, let's stay over there so we can go over the basics of animating keyframes in Resolve. It's a bit of a different flow than Premiere is, but once you've done it, it has some nice features. So let's do like a basic slide and push in. So I'm gonna go up to the position, we'll add a keyframe. I'm also gonna to go to the zoom and add a keyframe. We'll just play it for a second. We're gonna zoom in a little bit and then maybe it slides over that way. That doesn't really make a lot of sense, but just for the sake of argument, we're gonna use that. Now, if I wanna adjust it, I'm actually gonna click this keyframe icon right here and I can see these two keyframes on our transform. You can see the, the transform keyframes, it lines up. Now this is actually both parameters rolled in. Our zoom and position are both on this keyframe. So if I move both of them, it moved both parameters. But if I don't wanna do that and I wanna adjust them individually, you can click this arrow and that's gonna give us a drop down. So now I can adjust the zoom. Maybe I want the zoom to start later for some reason. Now it starts sliding, then it zooms, and it still looks terrible. Now next to it, I'm gonna move this back, we have a graph editor. Just so we can see this easier, I'm gonna get rid of the position keyframes. And in the graph editor, you can actually adjust the easing of your keyframes so you can get some nice like smoother animations, ramp up, ramp down. You just wanna go select your keyframes and then you can click one of these over here and you'll get a nice little ease curve. I'll do the same thing on this one. And you can ease it. And now it sort of zooms in, starting slow, speeds up, and then slows back down. And that just adds some nice finesse to your animations. I'm gonna reset all this. We don't need it anymore. And now we're gonna talk about speed ramping. Like in Premiere, you can right click the clip you wanna change and you'll get a few options. For more straightforward changes, you can just click the change speed option and you could just type in a slower speed or you could reverse the speed and it would do that. I'm gonna undo. I'm gonna right click again and go back to that. You can also just add a freeze frame, which adds a cut and a frozen frame of that same clip. If you wanna get more precise, you're gonna to need to use the retime controls and the retime curves. Here you can add keyframes to specific frames in the video and then change the clip speed in between those frames. So if I go to this little drop down arrow, I'll hit add speed point, go over here, do another speed point, 
and then I just want to slow it down in the middle for some reason. So we'll say change speed to 50%. So it starts at real speed, slows down, then speeds back up again. You could add curves again so it kind of eases into those slowdowns. If I undo all this really quick, it also has some preset speed changes. So if you click on this drop down again, go down to the bottom, and let's say we want to speed ramp down to zero, you can do that and it kind of automatically just puts those keyframes in for you and slows it down. Let's escape the speed graphs now and we'll check out the effects panel. There's a lot in here, so let's just go down each category to make it a little more digestible. So we start at the top in our toolbox, we'll go down to video transitions and that's pretty standard stuff here. These are transitions that you can just add to the beginning or end of your clips. You can actually scrub across them to preview what they would look like. Double click or drag and drop and it just drops it onto a cut on your timeline. Now some are pretty useful like these dissolves that kind of blur or cross dissolve. That's pretty standard. Smooth cut over here is kind of like morph cut in Premiere Pro like you would do to hide a cut in an interview or something like that. A lot of these other transitions in here are pretty corny like come on I'm not going to use that. But they're there. You might find some things that are useful. And if you want to make adjustments to any of these transitions you can actually just click that transition in the timeline go back up to the inspector and you'll have some more options. You can actually just change the type right here if you wanted, change the duration. You can also align it to different edges of the cut, add some easing to it if you like, pretty flexible. Moving on down, go to audio transitions, just have some crossfades, pretty straightforward. You can also just do a simple crossfade if you click a cut, right click, and you can just add a crossfade. Next up you have titles. So if you want to make a title 90% of the time, I'm just going to grab a regular text effect, text generator, and drag it onto the sequence. You can just type in what you want to say in the big box. You have all of the options you would expect like your font, the weight, the size of the text, tracking which is like the, the space in between, line spacing, all of that stuff. Position of the text. Of course you have color which will open up this little color window. Add a stroke, add a drop shadow, add backgrounds to the text if you want. As you can see, graphic design is my passion. I'm going to delete this and show you that you could also use text plus which gives you a lot of the same options and also gives you some extra stuff. What makes Text Plus different is that it's actually tied to Fusion and pretty much every single parameter is actually animatable slash keyframeable. So if you really want to get in there, have you have a ton of options and make some fancy custom stuff, you could do that. But honestly, if I'm going to have a more detailed animated title, I think I'm just going to make it in After Effects and render it out and drop it in here. That's just how I work. but want to let you know that it's there. What's also useful are all of these Fusion presets and titles that are in here that you can use for things like lower thirds. If I scrub over them they play through and you have a ton of options for titles, labels, lower thirds, you name it. And some of these are pretty nice for projects that you need to get out the door quickly. Again you can tweak them in the inspector panel. And if I have the selected Fusion titles are actually adjustable on the Fusion page if you want to get into that sort of thing. Next tab is the Generators tab. A lot of this stuff is really technical like color bars and gray scales. However, I will point you to one, just a solid color which does what it says. It just creates a solid color that you can tell it what you want it to be. You can also use four color gradient and you can adjust those colors. And I use these pretty often if I just want to do some sort of solid background or color overlay. You can do that here. Those are quite useful. Next up, if we go to effects, probably the most important thing here is an adjustment clip. This is just like an adjustment layer 
inside of Premiere or After Effects. When you drop it on your timeline, it affects every layer underneath it with whatever effects you put on the adjustment layer. Moving on down, OpenFX has a lot of really good effects, like lots of blurs, some color effects, a lot of other really fun stylization things in here. However, 99% of the time, I would probably use these effects on the color page, so I want to come back to these in a minute. Last up is audio effects. There's a lot here too, but a few effects I use regularly would be the de effect, which removes harsh S sounds or hissing sounds. Uh, the de-hummer, which use, you can use for removing electrical or AC noise. I use the multi-pan compressor for quick mixes, noise reduction, reverb for light echo effects, and the soft clipper to kind of limit the volume and prevent audio from blowing out. You can get a lot deeper with audio mixing on the audio page, but I'm not an audio guy, so I just mostly use a handful of these things. Before I move on, the last thing I'll mention about effects is that you can add favorite effects with the star on the right side of each one. So if I just click that star, it'll add it to my favorites list. And I already have a few down here, the dehummer, solid color, adjustment clip, text, because I use these all the time and you can just click and drag them over for fast, quick access. Going over the media and edit pages probably covers most of what you need if you're coming from Premiere. The next three pages, Fusion, Color, and Audio, all have a lot to get into with them, and each could have their own dedicated videos. In the interest of time, I'm just only going to touch on the basics so you can get started with each. So the Fusion page is primarily a visual effects and compositing app. It actually used to be a separate app, but now it's been integrated into DaVinci Resolve. So in here we aren't looking at our full timeline, we're only looking at the last clip or Fusion comp that we were looking at on the edit page. So Fusion is a node-based system versus a layer-based system. So what that means is we have nodes, a node tree here in the bottom. By default, every shot is going to have a media in node. This is our footage. And if you go up to the inspector, you can see this is the clip number that we're using. In a media out node. This is the final output of all the nodes and effects and things that we end up using in our node tree. This is the final result. So you can see this dot underneath is our viewer. You can see the second dot is selected and so that's outputting just this piece of footage to this monitor. This is our second monitor. If I select the first one, you can see now it's putting it in monitor one. So just to give a quick example, if I click our first media in node and I add some text to it, it automatically adds some text and a merge node. I'm going to add that text. We'll just call it hello. And you can see what it's doing is now we have our footage, our text, and a merge node that's literally taking both of these inputs, merging them together, and sending them to our output. And if I were to actually select our media and put that in the first viewer, you can see that this is our source footage unaffected because we are using just the footage here and sending it to our viewer one, whereas viewer two is receiving the entire chain of nodes. There's a lot you could do in Fusion. Things that you could do would include clone stamping or painting out objects. You could do green screen keying, motion tracking. You could also do more advanced text animation like we talked about earlier. I'm gonna delete all these things for now. If you need to make a mask, you can do that pretty easily with this footage selected. We can go over to our masking tools over here. You have a rectangle mask, you have an elliptical mask. Also, I'm gonna delete these. You can just free draw a mask with one of these tools here and there you go. Now you have a custom mask. The last thing I will note about Fusion is that it makes changes to the raw footage before your color grading. So any changes or effects that you make here will be carried over to the color page and your grades will be applied on top of whatever this final result is. So if I go to the color page, you can see it brought in this janky mask. And if you're finding this content helpful and you're excited to make the switch to DaVinci Resolve, give this video a like, that way some more people can find it and learn how to use DaVinci 2. And with that, let's take a look at the color page. Alright, the moment a lot of you have probably been waiting for. This is the color page. There's a ton to get into here as well. DaVinci is of course most famous probably for its color grading suite. We could talk about a lot of things, but I'll show you how this works compared to Lumetri in Premiere. 
So to start, you can see all of our clips here in the middle. If you don't see them, click this clips button right here. And we can just jump from shot to shot. And if you also want to see a visual representation of your timeline, you can do that as well. In this case, it's just, I just have one track, so it's pretty flat. Now, like Fusion, the first thing to understand is that color grading in DaVinci Resolve uses a node-based system. So when you make adjustments, they are saved to individual nodes. And by default, we start off with one node. If you want to make another node, you could right-click, add node, correct our node. Then you could manually go and connect it. You have to connect your input to your output, or you could just use the keyboard shortcut option S on your computer. Now you can have a ton of nodes in your chain if you want connected together as long, again, as they all run through together to, from the input to the output. There are multiple types of nodes. You can see lots of different options in this menu. But for now, I'm just going to stick with a regular corrector or serial node, uh, which don't do anything fancy. They just add adjustments on top of the previous nodes. I'm also going to open up these scopes in the bottom right corner. If they're hidden, you might see this. They're right here. And then you can pop them out to see more at once. You have multiple views up here. So I typically work with a four panel view. Also, if you want to learn more about scopes, I did a video a little while ago about getting accurate colors using color charts and scopes, so you can check that out after you finish this video. Now, you'll probably spend the most of your time in the primaries panel down in the bottom left. This has a lot of options that are probably going to be familiar to you if you're coming from Lumetri. First and foremost, we have our color wheels, our lift, gamma, gain, and offset. Lift adjust the dark parts of our image, the gamma is the middle of our image, the gain is the highlights, high points of our image. If we use the slider underneath, it's going to adjust the luminance of that wheel. So if I want to add some more contrast into this, I can lift our gain up, which brightens up the image, then bring the lift down a little bit, bring the gamma down a little bit, and now we have a contrastier, poppier image. You can, of course, add color into the wheels as well. So, you know, if you want to go for the typical cooled off shadows, you know, warm highlights, orange and teal look, do something like that. As for the offset, that actually moves the entire image all at once. So instead of just targeting, you know, your shadows or your highlights, this is just going to move the entire thing all together. You also have a white balance controls, your temperature right here. You have tint controls. These are both pretty standard. Contrast controls. You also have saturation, hue, shadow, and highlight controls. This is kind of a funky look. Very vaporwave now. But those are all of your basic controls that you're probably used to in most color correcting apps. Now the next section you're probably used to is curves. Now Resolve has a lot of nice secondary options that utilize curves, starting with the standard S curve, which you can adjust the entire image all at once. You could add a little contrast curve like that, or you could focus in on the specific red, green, or blue channels. Then if we go through this little menu up here in the top right of that box, you have all the other different types of curves like hue versus hue. So let's pretend I want to take some of these oranges colors and shift them. I could do that. You could use hue versus saturation, which would take a hue and just desaturate that. So you could do something like that if you wanted. Hue versus luminance, which would brighten up that hue or darken it. I find that you have to be very careful with this one because it can really crack your image. And some other ones, luminance versus saturation, saturation versus saturation, and saturation versus luminance. You can experiment with all of these. But these four in the front are what I use the most. I'll also note that in the bottom left, you have some of the core colors that you can just click and it will automatically put little handles there for you so you can make those adjustments. Or like you saw me do earlier, you can go over your footage and use the eyedropper that comes up and just pick, you know, a, an area that you want to make adjustments to. Now, if you want to get a little more targeted with your color grades, you can use two more tools. The first is power windows which lets you mask out a specific area for color grading. So in this case, I will use a, an ellipse mask. We can move it. 
rotate it a little bit. We can, you know, squeeze it. This outside edge is the feathering of the mask. And if we hit Shift H, you can actually see the area that we're affecting. And we could make adjustments. And then if I turn that off, I'm just gonna brighten up this car. So I'm gonna go to our gain and we will just pop it out. And you can see, I turn that off here. You can see I popped out the car. It's a little overkill, but you get how it works. I'm gonna turn this back on. If I go over to the tracker window, I can actually use these keys to track forward and backward. And Resolve has a very good tracker. It's very fast and it is very accurate. I'm gonna go over to a different shot so I can show you the qualifier tool. That's this eyedropper tool right here. And if we click it and then we click and drag on our image, we use Shift H again to make sure you can see what you're selecting. You can see that we pulled a key of the paint of this car. Now it's not a perfect key, but for the sake of argument, you can see what it's doing. I can go down here and make adjustments to the hue range that it's affecting. If I wanna pull the less saturated areas, I could get, some of the, get rid of some of the darker spots. Let's pretend that for some reason is what I wanted. And then if I wanna go clean up this mat, you know, you can go to your clean black. That gets rid of some of the extra schmutz around. Clean white will fill in some of these spots that were not being selected before. If we go to the blur, we can just kind of blur the edge of our mat. In and out ratio kind of sh chokes the mat a little bit in and out. So this is not a very good key. You also probably want to use at least 10-bit footage. This is 8-bit footage just for this demonstration. And now with all of this selected, if I were to add some color into it, you can see I'm just adding some blue kind of into these areas that I had selected with the qualifier tool. So the qualifier is very powerful if you want to select color ranges and make some very specific adjustments. You just want to be careful with it because if you use lots of qualifiers, your image will probably start to fall apart. Go to reset all of this, get rid of these scopes. And the last thing I'm going to talk about over here is the O effects, which I mentioned earlier. To use them, you're just going to take one, drag it onto your node, and then the settings will pop up and you can make adjustments to that effect. Now, a lot of these are going to be locked behind the DaVinci Resolve Studio version, so you'll have to pay to access them, but I will highlight a few of the ones that I use all the time. Like you just saw, we have a lot of blurs in here. These are very useful. Another common one, if we search in the top, is Color Space Transform. This can convert from one color space to another, or if this was log footage, you could take your log footage to Rec. 709. You would just tell it the color space of the footage as it was shot, and then select the settings for what you want it to convert it to. Also, we could use glow. That's pretty self-explanatory. Adds a nice glow, and then you can adjust the threshold of that and the strength and spread. Film grain, also very common. It has presets for eight millimeters, 16 and 35. And then you could go in and also make adjustments to those. Lens flare, if you want to add some, some fake lens flare to your shots. Let's just scroll through. There's a lot of color effects, some keying effects, some other cleanup effects. There's a lot of things in here, so you should just go scroll through, take a look, experiment, and I'm sure you'll find a lot of fun tools to mess around with. And for future reference, if you install any effects plugins for Resolve, those are gonna appear in here as well, uh, unless they're Fusion templates, then they would be on the Fusion page, but most effects are gonna be in here. All right, now we are in the home stretch, and we are looking at the render page. The first thing I'll mention is that this shows you our timeline, which you can scrub through and see it all completed. You could tell it if you want to render the entire timeline or you could select an in and out range. If you don't want to do the whole thing, you just want to do part of it. I'm gonna switch it back to your entire timeline. 
Okay, let's take a look at our render settings. So right now I'm on a custom export and you could go down and select all of these settings and codecs and things yourself. You also have plenty of preset options like H.264, H.265, a ProRes, you have some social media settings. Uh, you also have audio only, Premiere XML, if you wanna to go to Pro Tools, you have a lot of different templates for you to use. We're gonna stick with custom for now and we'll just go down the list. So the first two settings are the name and the location that we wanted to save. For the time being, I'm just gonna save it to the desktop like it was already set. You can go in and name your file if you wanted, or if you wanted to use the name of the timeline, you can go over to file, timeline name. The name of the timeline was car, so it's just automatically gonna set it to be called car on export. Now if we look back at the other tabs, this is where we could set all of the codec settings for the file. So on the video tab, in this case, it's set to QuickTime, which would give us an MOV file. And then within that QuickTime file, you could set it to a various codecs. So you could do H.264, H.265, ProRes, DNX. You have all these options here. You could also set it to be an MP4, which is just an H.264 or H.265 file. Then you have your resolution and frame rate. It will just default to whatever your resolution and frame rate was. You can change it here, uh, and then DaVinci will actually give you a little warning, like, hey, what are you doing? Why are you changing it? But you're able to do that if you want. So you may have noticed that when you export things from DaVinci that you get probably a way bigger file size than you do when you export things with the default settings in Premiere. That's because DaVinci goes to a way higher bit rate than Premiere does by default. So if we go over here to set the bit rate, you can see it's set to 80,000 kilobits per second. That'd be the equivalent of in Premiere setting the high bit rate export setting to 80, which Premiere I think now defaults to 15. It used to default to 10. So this is, you know, eight times bigger than what that Premiere file size would be. So we could actually go in and adjust this and we can knock it down to maybe say 20 and we would end up at a much smaller file size. There are audio settings here as well. Usually I don't find myself usually needing to change these very much, but they are there if you wanna make adjustments. Now, once you have everything dialed in the way you want, you just go down to add to render queue and it pops up over here as a job in the render queue. Now you could have multiple jobs set up at once. It's kind of like media encoder. So say I want also now a ProRes file. I could do that, add it to the render queue, and now I have both here. Make sure you don't have any of them selected. That way you can render all of them. And when you're ready to go, just hit render. And there you go. You'll have finished your project in DaVinci Resolve. And we're done. That was a huge video about DaVinci Resolve, and of course there's plenty more for you to learn, but this should give you the foundation that you need to start editing and color grading comfortably inside of the app. Of course, if you missed anything or you wanna go back, I added chapter markers, so go check those out if you wanna jump around the video and watch something again. And if you wanna keep learning, I did another video a little while ago about the first settings that I changed in DaVinci Resolve, and a lot of people found that to be super helpful. So go give that a watch, get subscribed, and I will catch you in the next video.